It is. What is it? The 18th of March 2023 and you are listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Yeah, I'm all confused because this is not our usual time of recording. Hey, Adrian <laughs> and Jeremiah, how are you? No, uh, tired. It's early in the morning <laughs> for Jeremiah. I'm good. Yeah, uh, this, this 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 recording slot is interrupting my afternoon snooze and Jeremiah's just general nighttime sleep. I think. Isn't it? Well, I'm getting up a little bit earlier than I thought, so you know, I'm making my coffee and uh, oh god, okay. But but uh, but but you're you're also almost out the door to go oh, yeah. uh, on location again. I, yeah, I'm out the door tomorrow morning um, on location till mid July, uh, where I will be probably broadcasting from a very boomy, echoey room. So get ready for that. And uh, we've all been missing that totally. <laughs> but uh, looking forward to season two of my show, Reginald the Vampire. So awesome! There we go. The, we can the, clean the up. The team is back together. Hmm? Yeah, we can clean up your audio this time because Adobe's got a new toy, haven't they? That cleans up, the, <laughs> that takes away the room. Space don't, don't like give Jeremiah the impression he doesn't have to care about audio <laughs> because there is some magic tool that I will then slave <laughs> over for half an hour on his track. No. Um, okay. You know, anyway. I would build a little studio here for recording if I could with built-in cameras, multiple cameras, so I could. Keep I think I think we'll we'll show you how to build a blanket fort around your microphone. <laughs> yeah, in that, that which really place. works in Los Angeles in uh, with in the, in the summer when it's <laughs> with very warm. Yes, exactly. uh, and and uh, you won't allow me any air conditioning or warmth. <laughs> so with fans. yeah, so, I'm I'm, dra I'm draconian like that. Yes, that's uh, mm. okay. I appreciate the sound quality which you know on my show i beat up sound constantly <laughs> so there you go now you see how it, what it's what like being on the other side do what i say <laughs> okay we have um just a couple of things on today's episode um the last episode we talked about adrian's website uh, and he got a lot of input from us and adrian has worked on something so we might have a little sneak peek there uh, also a couple of news items and of course our picks of the week um yeah Adrian, should well, i should i reveal it, the website all, put it on it the go, screen go no how did it go it. It. how did you do it tell, well, tell us I, how I you built you what, it i tell you what I, I did it by sheer force of willpower when you said to me last week jeremiah i'll believe it when i see it i think you know right. <laughs> i haven't seen it yet so <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, you've made a website. I have made a website for the for how the, what tell us everything about it. Well, it, there's not so much to tell actually when it, when it comes down to it. It was it was a fairly straightforward process. So uh, yeah, I made a website. I put some of my photos on it, and um, yeah, it was it was it was fun and it was easy and. Uh, yeah, and it's out there. People can go look at it. I'm surprised you haven't shared it on the screen already, Chris. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've asked if I should, and no one said anything. Oh, no, I will it, yeah. bring sure, it on the screen Absolutely. now. So here we are, adrianstock.com. Adrianstock.com. That's com. me. Yes. Which is, which is, first of all, good choice of domain, because you can be found by your name now. And not yeah, yeah. Um, which is interesting. Else. Yeah, I, I've never reserved that domain before i just went looking for it and it was like oh it's there um, it was oh it was fresh it was still available yeah, wow yeah. amazing yeah. in so, 2023 yeah that is amazing yeah so never yeah that's a, that's i i registered that uh, uh last week and uh then built the website um or did i build i think i built the website first and then registered the domain and then linked the two together so but it was really so, easy to do so so you 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 did you did you go for for a service of some sort? Um, yes. Just from the so, technical side. So um, for yeah, outside the photography world, for our business, uh, we use Squarespace to host our website. There you go. Uh, so I went there first, and it was just really easy. Um, <laughs> it's drag and drop, yeah. Uh, it, yes, there's a little bit more than that in the sense that I wanted to make sure it was uh, it worked well on mobile as well as on desktop. 
Um, so, but I mean, it, you, you build it in the desktop environment on Squarespace or in a desktop view, uh, and then you you just it's one click and it will give you the preview of what it would look like on a smaller right. vertical screen. And so. and this episode is not sponsored by them. No, I know they not, sponsor no. a lot of podcasts. They don't sponsor they, us. Yeah, no, <laughs> this is this is just me as a paying customer of Squarespace, yeah. um, and uh, because they're not a sponsor, I can say they're not cheap, right? <laughs> Um, compared to other services that will give you a basic photography where, uh, website, um, Squarespace is more than double the cost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, when I I didn't look at that before I built it. <laughs> I just went because we already had an account for our business. I went in and just thought, oh, this how how hard can this possibly be? I went in and built it. Uh, and then uh, what happened was I got to the end and it said, if you want to make this live, you've got to pay for it, which, of course, don't mind paying for it. And then I was like, mm -hmm. how much? <laughs> Went and looked at some other websites and was like, oh, uh, and was tempted to, to bin it and start again. But actually, the thing that really kept me in it was that I really liked the template I found on Squarespace and none of the other website hosting people I found uh, had a template that I liked. So. So you did go for the for the zine kind of look. Yes, uh, I, I zine. So so building on the the zine I did last year, which you can see here is the top piece of content in it. So what I've done is I've put the spreads in, um, you know, uh, and uh, you know took took the words out and put them as text blocks, and then put the spreads in from the zine. So that's there now, and then some other small collections of work from over the years. Some of them quite oh, old, so actually. So, so this, this, the, the, the first page that you scroll through, those are all links. Because yes. I was initially not aware that those were clickable, even ah, though the mouse well. pointer changes. But I didn't have a, a clear, like, I don't know what I was expecting, kind of an underlined thing or a button or something. I think I've made it even worse than that, actually. I think I've made it so it's the images that are clickable, not the text. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, live and learn. That. How's their customer service, by the way? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So it's um, you know the, these are uh, this particular collection you're looking at now goes back to I think 2010, 2011. Uh -huh. um, so it, the 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 technical side of this, we're building it was very very easy. I mean, you you pick a, a template that has a based upon the graphic design essentially uh, of that template, mm -hmm. and then once you've chosen it, you get all sorts of different page layouts uh, that you can you can use. Uh, so I've got a simple scrolling front page, um, and then if you click on any of the images on the front page, you get to a standard gallery template. I picked one out of millions. Um, that I figured would work, and then if you click looks on just it, very simple, very yeah. very uh, visually un inobtrusive. Here's a question: um, How um, manageable or adjustable are the individual images in terms of size, quality, um, loading speed, uh, page adjustment adjustments within the templates you've chosen, and how is customer service? Uh, okay, uh, so the uh, the first question, the answer is it's all taken care of for you. So you upload your images to uh, uh, an asset folder you know, uh, in the, the back end of the website service. Uh, and you, you know, then they just get rendered um, as appropriate. Um, so the, no, no need, essentially. Um, you, can choose the, you can choose the gallery layouts. So, for example, I mean, this one Chris is showing here has three columns. Uh, you can set that to one column, two columns, three columns. Yeah, so you can, so you can um, do those um, per gallery page in, in any way you see fit. So if you wanted to have it as loads and loads of tiny thumbnails, you could do that. If you wanted to have it just a single you know, image at a time, you could do that. Do you load them in 300 dpi and it will adjust it to 72? Or do you, are you forced to... Uploaded in 72? Uh, not forced at all. You just upload the files. So as far as I'm aware, um, you know, the DPI number would be relevant for printing rather than for website rendering. No. Well, seven, like a 300 is not really <laughs> something that, that a website loves or embraces. Uh, well, and... And unless you unless you have like the modern retina displays that go over three hundred even, and yeah. you want the highest possible resolution, but then of course you are you are kind of messing with the loading times a bit. I think those systems, like Squarespace or Wix or Jimdo or whatever their names are, um, will 
pretty much dynamically take care of that. So if you if you upload something and it's it's um, responsive, it will probably have multiple resolutions for multiple screen sizes automatically generated in the background. That's my experience so far. So some of these images are going to be pretty small, to be honest, uh, less than four megapixels, perhaps, because some of them were taken on a phone from about 2010. Right. Oh, and, and it's doing uh, the, the template is doing something nice, which uh, it's called lazy loading. So when you scroll, you can see them come into view at the bottom. So they are being, it's, it's not the entire gallery is loaded at once, but it loads them when it needs them. So that also helps the whole traffic situation too. Yeah, yeah. Be, so um, uh, that's, that, that was good to see. I didn't know that. Um, the, the, the real answer to your question, Jeremiah, is I haven't had any problems at all. And I, I, ha I built building it was really easy. Um, when I tested it, I tested it on a desktop you know, or, or a laptop, I should say, uh, but a desktop view. And I tested it on a phone. Um, I made some you can you can tweak bits and bobs in the interface in the designing interface to, to make sure that it renders the way you want it to. And it's just mm -hmm. really easy. The whole but thing I, I think I think if you want the four hours work, if if you want full DPI and that kind of stuff control, then th that's probably not the right system for you. There well, are others. Tell me DPI. So so DPI dots print right. So I would have thought that the thing that would be the prevailing issue in a website would be the number of pixels rather than the dots per inch, which is more of a print metric. Or have I misunderstood well, that? Yes and no. If you look at <clears throat> if you look at screens, let's go back to the '90s. The screens were typically around 72 DPI. If you go back, uh, if you go forward, maybe 10 years, screens were more in the 90 90s Two, range DPIs, yeah. and then high DPI started coming up. So you you can have DPI. The problem is with DPI in on screens is that you never know what screen. Your pictures well, going to display different, on. aren't they? I mean, yeah, they are all two different. Phones the same size will be different, right? So and if you and if you print something, you will know what the printer will use, and then you can really go very, very specific. Uh, today's web browsers are do a really good job at resizing things. So I'd rather have a slightly higher resolution um, and have the have the web browsers pretty much take. So care I, of the I, I uploaded these at whatever the full resolution of them was. So some of them would have been really low because they were the oldest things and shot on phones. Some of them are modern and are up, uh, you know probably around sixteen megapixels or something like that. Um, uh, I don't think I had anything that would have been a, any bigger than that in terms of file size. On on my website, I. I you know, I'm pretty well forced to keep things, I mean, for loading speeds and whatnot, certainly under 600K per image. At 72, they load really well, and they look pretty good. When I print, obviously, that same image would be 300. Oh, totally different, and, yeah. And 25 <laughs> to 50 megapixels, and they look good, too, so... Um, it's a it's a very very tricky business. Also, you don't know the. Uh, are you looking at something on your phone with a cellular network that is dodgy, yeah. or are you looking at a high speed, really kind of fat pipe, fiber optic on a great but, screen? But even there, those those services, those big systems, they will take a lot of that complexity out for you yeah. because there are now ways uh, in CSS. Pretty much, if if you dig really deep, there are ways to. Determine the screen size um, and then serve one out of several yeah. different resolution images depending on the size. So yeah. this is all, all being done for you in the background. Yeah, most instance. of them do the um, adoption into mobile, whether it's iPad yes. or iPhone, yes. um, to look their best. And, and um, yeah, that's what you, that's, that that's the thing you pay for. That's why you pay so much for these I things. Think, <laughs> they, they, there's, there's stuff that I know relates to you know slightly deeper CSS tags that are simply offered as part of the user interface in Squarespace so things like um, the image that returns for social sharing so when you share a, a, a website link on on a social media platform or something like that and it brings a little image with it um, that's that's a, actually a, a, a CSS tag in the real in the real engineering world but in the abstracted world where you've got an interface like squarespace to build in that's just a upload your thing here and and that's what it does and so it's all taken care of for you so as chris says maybe that's what maybe that's where the uh, the the money goes the magic that's that's why people why people have uh, have flocked to these th to, to these platforms because they 
you don't really need to know a lot and they still work quite well. And all those yeah. people who are charging money to build websites? Oh, you know, I when Robot? I when I started with the web in the 90s, I did a use a text editor to write my website, so yeah. it's very different. Yeah, I mean, my, my my first ever business, my first ever startup that I did in 2001, I had a friend who was a graphic designer and he, he built all the websites and and stuff like that. It was all all sorts of that stuff, but of course these days it's uh, Plug and play. Uh, a lot of it is. If you, as long as you know, I think the compromise is is if you have something that's really specific and you want to get really into the nitty gritty of what the yeah. user experience is, then then these things are not necessarily for you. Sure. Like if I, you are happy with, and I wouldn't even say it's eighty twenty. I'd say it's probably more like ninety ten. If you're happy with a ninety ninety five percent fit for your vision against what the user experience is, then I think you'd probably be able to find a template to do it. Sure, like like on I, I know that um, on the uh, sites that I use, you know, you can adjust it so you can have uh, wild gardens within it. You can give people or clients, if that's the case, uh, access to certain folios. They can download a PDF of the thumbnails or even the images. You can give them permission to actually download the files if they want. Uh, so there's adjustable aspects even within the site of how the interface will work with people who are more than just observing. All right, so now that you made your website is is that is that it or is that just like <laughs> a, a a template an ongoing so, an ongoing thing now. So that's an interesting point, isn't it? Um I I don't think I have a, a clear answer. I'd like to use it to give me some momentum to produce more bodies of work. Um, so from that point of view, it's it's serving a good purpose and I, I intend to, to do stuff with it. I don't intend it to be static for the next 10 years. Um, so that's that, so that's something. You know, it gives me a reason to go back and edit stuff. So for example, uh, last Sunday, I went out and I met a few friends. There's only four of us in, in London. And we had a day of walking around the city you know, with our cameras, occasionally stopping for coffee, um, later on in the afternoon, stopping for drinks. Uh, and we had a really, really nice day out. And I shot 350, 400 photos across the course of the day. And you know, often I would leave those, I'd look at them, I'd probably favorite a few. Uh, uh, but then well, okay yeah great no problem I'll come back to them at some point in the future and then you know could be years um, now I'm thinking to myself actually I should probably go through those a bit better you know do a bit of a cull you know get down to you know 15 to 20 or so that I think might form a bit of a gallery and maybe that could go on my website um, I'd do some editing perhaps as well you know, who knows you know it's you know Often I just mark things with potential, right? And then say, yeah, they're there and I'll come back to them at some unspecified time for, for uns unspecified project in I, the future. I have, a, I have an idea and something I throw out to you guys. Um, if, if I've never used Squarespace, but it seems very um, simple to use. So, for example, if you went out and shot a subject... Um, and by subject, I mean it could be a downtown landscape. It could be, like in my case, you know, the, the canals that I photographed daily during the pandemic lockdown when I was just walking every day, photographing the same environments, different lenses, different cameras, you know, pinholes, just always reinterpreting the, the reality. Just taking that body of work and throwing it up on a website and calling the website by the subject name for obvious reasons so somebody searching right so your seo would be linked completely to the website and the subject of the website and the subject of the pictures so that anybody going you know uh, venice canals would immediately go not to my website but to that website um i think the seo of it all is adjustable and is the um SEO, is that something that is integrated into the back end of the process within? Oh, it is, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, there, so so there you're, you're suggesting you stuff in. You, you're suggesting individual domains per album? 
Yeah. Like canalsofvenice.com? Yeah, something like that. Uh, you know okay. what I mean? I, I, I just thought of it now, so I'm kind of speaking out of my ass. But, but uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of it is, is just like, how do you use a website different than just self-promotion or, or a way of kind so of... So I think you probably could do gallery. that because, um, for, so, so for example, I, I registered my domain name with Google, um, which, you know, having looked at a few reviews is a reasonably priced um yeah uh, reasonably vanilla domain registration service yeah. then they they have google domain management has an integration point to squarespace so my website has two urls essentially it has one that's a something 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 dot squarespace dot com um uh, which is a set of, uh, basically a, a fairly random generated url and then of course there's the domain name that i've got and you direct the domain name to it to the url that squarespace provides you so i suspect you could do that because if you had all the domain names uh you could direct them to individual pages on your website mm. and uh then you would be able to yeah you would be able to cross collateralize yeah, yeah. I so I mean, it's it's not the cheapest way of directing. No, no, to your I'm website. not it's suggesting it's a cost-effective yeah. way of presenting work. Yes. But, uh, but and, but and it's, the other from the other end, what you could do is on your walk, um, you know, on your daily walk, you could then use. I think Squarespace has an app, a phone app for doing basic admin stuff. Uh, you could probably upload your photo directly from your phone into your website and have it added yes. to the album. And I'm sure other services can do that as well. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, like, they all they all offer you mobile uh, putting stuff in, and before you know it, you will not be out shooting and then thinking, "What could I put in an album?" You will be going out to shoot for your next album because now you have that spot to do it. It's what I'm suggesting. I think that that's yeah. a good motivation, um, just good interaction. It's like you know, if you're doing a, a an ex exhibition at a gallery, if one is doing that, and it's coming up in several months or a year. You're very motivated to kind of really be hard on yourselves in terms of what you shoot, how you shoot, what the kind of presentation, instead of just randomly doing it. So, so well done. Deadlines. Well yeah. done. And from now on, I we'll ask now. you. I believe it. Yeah. And from now on, we'll ask you every week if you have any new albums up. And okay. do people comment? Do you have an area for comment and... No. I haven't put that in yet. So, so it, is, it is it is relatively basic so far. Um, uh, the, there's no direct <laughs> feedback loop. Um, what I but I have got the you know the opportunity to, to add more functionality to it. So add those kinds of things. Add, Allowing comments yeah. is an entire huge headache these days. I would yeah. think. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not add, for it. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> but but contact directly is interesting. Um, that um, I have. I have a page that just allows people to contact me directly sure, like through the sure. web. And that is very, very effective of people who you don't know, but you're not giving them your private email address. Yeah, I um, can definitely um, add one of those and I can add commerce out. stuff and I can add all sorts of stuff to it that, that and, again, is just drag and drop. But. And of course, uh, thanks for putting links to your favorite podcasts on there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, there is a All link right. to the future of photography, uh, absolutely. And Sunny 16, of and course. 16. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, good job. I'm, I'm happy to see that. Some Me news. too, actually. Are we going to... Let's dive into some new news. Is that... Um, yeah, just, just a couple of news items that I came across recently that I found interesting. Um, first one is... Okay, so you guys know MKBHD, Marcus Brownlee. He reviews tech on YouTube and he just had a short... What was the five-minute video? That he starts off with, what is a photo? And um, it goes into detail around something that has been happening with uh, with the latest Samsung uh, Galaxy, I don't know, flag flagship phone. Um, and he explains a bit about photos and then he goes into the, a thing that has recently been happening with uh, smartphones that have like these extreme zoom capabilities and that is shooting pictures of the moon. And uh, a while ago, I think, ah, who was that? Huawei, I think, had uh, this capability in their smartphone, like 100x zoom or 1000x zoom or whatever. And you would point it at the moon and then it would 
magically have a, 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 a well lit, good, um, not overexposed, sharp, Very detailed, yes, detailed image of the moon. And there was a lot of rumors: is that AI replacing the photo, and isn't it? And 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 Marcus Brownlee had a video out a while ago where he's like, I think that's debunked. I think they're really doing that. Because they they can recognize, so there's AI in there, they can recognize the moon and then they can drop the exposure, they can lock in the, the stabilizer and, and, and get it to work somehow. Um, but now a new experiment has come up and that's with the latest flagship by Samsung. And what they did is, someone on Reddit tried this and, and Marcus Brownlee re reproduced that, is what you do is you take this flagship phone that has that capability and you put a picture of the moon on a screen all the way across the room, right? So there's a black screen with a picture of the moon. That picture of the moon, uh, you blur that. So you make it a, a kind of a picture of the moon, but a very blurred one with no detail whatsoever. And then you point that smartphone from all the way across the room. So it, it kind of thinks, oh, that's the moon, because it recognizes it. It's, it's bright on black. It's... In, a, in the distance and it does its magic and it produces a sharp detailed picture, picture of the moon, of the moon. <laughs> who, who would have guessed surely and that is just, kind surely of you could do that just, test just by taking a picture of the real moon in airplane mode <laughs> <laughs> well again I mean I mean it the thing is you can it's not too hard to 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 swap that out because the moon always shows us the same face um, with slight variations and with, uh, I don't know, sometimes the moon is a bit smaller and bigger, but in general you could probably do that. And it seems there is at least some weird oh. enhancement going on there. And there are uh, some, something weird is happening there and it points very strongly towards the AI generating detail in which way ever. I'm... Maybe they have a database full of photos in there that they then swap out or not. But, um, yeah, so Samsung has been caught red-handed, I think. Yeah, I, I, that, that's the whole discussion of, like, the integration of AI in yes. the machine. And, you know, you're talking about it being processed in the cloud. But soon these things are going to be, you know, in your hand, right? The, all the processing power will be in the actual camera. Um, yes, you know, you can load these models uh, well within um, a small, you know, chip. And, uh, you know, whether it's to clean up skin, replace eye color, um, change leaf color, you know, all, all of those things are fairly basic. And um, I, I think we'll see in the next generation of cameras, if not phones, the ability to do that, uh, you know, at will. And, and of, of, go ahead. Of course, the question is: Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Because <sighs> us as photographers who are uh, like into the pixel peeping and everything, that is is pretty much a no no, at least for me. But then, if you look at I don't know, if you look at the the the, the, the smile on the face of someone who has never had. A been able to take a good picture of the moon and has always envied those people with the long lenses and the big gear and uh, then all of a sudden their smartphone can do this well that's um, yeah that's a runway to the obvious question what is a photograph or is and they a photograph a capture of reality and um, right. you know one could argue until one's blue in the face that a black and white shot of a gorgeous landscape like even the classics of Weston or Ansel Adams, et cetera, et cetera, Salgado, are they capturing reality? I mean, we look at them, we think, wow, I believe that, that's real. But in fact, black and white is the most abstract of, of, of capture, and it's just we embrace the history of photography and are, are able to interpolate the what we consider reality but in fact you know a photograph there, there was a very uh, famous uh, quote by Picasso I'm, I'm going to try and get this right but uh, he had painted uh, a portrait of um, some gentleman's wife 
And and uh, the man came to see it, and he said, "Oh man, that, that <laughs> that's horrible. It doesn't look like that, that. That doesn't look like my wife." He says, and Picasso asked him, "Well, do you have a, a photo of, of your wife?" And he pulled it out, and he says, "Yeah, this is this is um, my wife's little." And he says, oh, that, "That's odd. It's just a little square piece of." paper that is, you know, three inches by two inches that, that doesn't, I thought your, your wife was a lot bigger than that. <laughs> and anyway, the, the, this guy, probably bastardizing the quote, but I'm sure he said it more elegantly than I, but, but in fact, he was making a comment that all manner of capture is a interpretation of the work. And in fact, um, we know, those who've had cataracts or lenses put in our eyes, that we see completely different. That, that reality, it could be subtle, it could be major, but certainly with color, um, uh, our, it's our brain that interprets or decides what's real, and not our culture. I mean, I, or I'm, I'm in the scientific way. <laughs> Culturally, it, it's the culture that decides yes. what's real. And I think that's the endless argument. Yes, it will always be. So um, if you have a Samsung flagship phone, then... Go for yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Um, okay, second and last piece of news um, that I recently came across. Uh, Jeremiah, do you do printing? Or at least you, you go to a printer, you I have do someone... A lot of you do a lot of printing... Of 90% of my printing is done here in the studio. Yeah, and, and then some of those printers have special inks and they are like they are. very, very mm -hmm. art uh, related. But then other people might have, I don't know, an office printer or something sure. that can do photos. And um, one of those manufacturers is HP. And HP has recently gotten a lot of bad press because they have released an update to one of their printer series, office jet kind of printers um, that ratchets up the DRM on the ink cartridges. So so, so where, where in an art world you might want to have freedom to use third-party inks because that's, some of those might be specially formulated or in an office world where you might want to be able to use refilled carpet cartridges because they are so much cheaper than the originals and they will probably do for 90% of your printing which might only be charts and, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, HP has had the their software has had the warning. Like if you put in a third-party cartridge, a refilled cartridge, the, the software would warn you. Um, yeah, you might have difficulties with that. It might not be perfect. Um, just be aware of that. You should use originals, and then you click that away, and then, then you print it with a third-party cartridge. And now with uh, some of the office jets, that was not possible anymore. People who w were used to being able to print with their third-party cartridges all of a sudden couldn't because <coughs> the software said, nope, that's not an HP cartridge. It doesn't have an HP chip in it. Uh, uh, I'm yeah. not going to print. Th th this plays directly into some of my own personal <laughs> experiences. Um, I'm using Epson, and uh, one of my printers has been uh, converted to the piezo system, which I've talked about. Uh, in the past, um, and uh, but many of their newer printers will not convert. Canon, I don't think, is can, can interpret the rips that I print with. Uh, you can't use third party, or certainly they don't. Um, but when I need when um, I need to replace the cartridge, I need to order a normal cartridge and then replace the chip. I, I basically take the chip off and put it on the other cartridge and then fill it with ink, so thereby fooling uh, the the um, the computer in the uh, printer. Now you know I I think that anybody who really wants to will just buy a cartridge and replace it, but that's sixty or seventy dollars, and and who needs that? So. Yes, there is a, a a battle going on here between selling inks, razor blades, whatever you want to call and, it. Well, it's it's the it's the old Gillette model, right? You buy the printer, the office printer, for almost no money, and then they make it in inks, sure. of course. Yeah. Um, the, the HP has had. I mean, this has this has created such an outcry that they have now. 
uh, walk that back slightly. Um, they, they write that after a sustained public outcry, <laughs> he has said it will release an optional firmware update that will remove the DRM sometime in the next two weeks. And then they said a small number of customers have been affected, a very marketing, right? A small number of customers have been affected and, stre and they stressed that it would continue to deploy similar security features in the future. Security. So this is just a temporary thing and they call it a security feature because, of course... The, Of course, it'll. <laughs> so I don't know. Deploy it's, agents to your some, home. Some, something, something, children, something, something, terrorism, and <laughs> then you can't sell your yeah. cartridges anymore. Anyway, yeah. so. Yeah, I, I think that. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Now, by, ink, by the way, ink from, in, ink, from ink, from, ink from printer manufacturers. You know, the branded ink is is more expensive than gold. It's more expensive. It's than, very expensive. Than, than, and 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 that literally that by weight. Yes, I have. Um, the, the interesting thing is I have been in an HP development lab, uh, like where they make the printers and they test them and so on, back in 2008. I spent a few days there. And um, they do test a lot for, for longevity, for like uh, color stability with UV light, and they have big UV chambers and uh, ozone chambers and things where they, where they test their <laughs> own papers with their own inks and of course third-party inks including all the refills that you can get they test all of them and uh if if you want those prints to last long in the sun or, or in the daylight outside not in a in a closed case where no ozone can get to it and so on they, they their own inks with the with the with the right papers will last longer typically Sure. I've seen they, that in action. Yeah. So, so if you want archival quality and that kind of stuff, absolutely go for the originals with the recommended papers. But if you want something that that lasts for a week or five weeks or a month and uh, doesn't really matter if it bleaches out slightly, then hey, third party stuff is. So if I, if I print my son a script so that he can go to rehearsals for his show, sure. Um, uh, I, I, pretty much most weeks, only half the script comes back. <laughs> um, I don't know who's archiving bits of Patrick's scripts, but um, yeah, possibly, uh, possibly the bin men. Um, but yeah, I, I think what we're talking about here is, for me, it's one percent of one percent of one percent, right? Who would really value that? And I think, yeah, for me, I, I, I'm against this, not because I'm against copyright controls and things like that, but I think actually, if there's a premium product with a premium price, they should be able to justify it based upon the quality of the product. And, and, and let supply and demand play a role in it, right? Not well, choke yeah. off. The, in, in the European Union, that would be called anti-competitive, I suspect. Yes. Well, you know, last time I was in China, um, I remember reading the China Daily that some uh, factory had just been closed down and the owner arrested. They were making, you know, I think HP or Canon cartridges, looked identical with extremely cheap inks. Um, that were just, <laughs> you know, water and color, basically, but had been doing it for years and years and years and years. Uh, and we're talking about millions and millions of dollars and shipped all over the world. And uh, he was brought to trial and they wanted to make an example of him. The Americans were putting some pressure on them in terms of violations, etc. And they did. They fined him uh, $300. <laughs> You know what I mean? And the factory opened a few weeks later with a different brand. But par part of it is, you know, it's the buyer beware. You have to know what you want, like Chris said. If you yes. only want to print something, you know, a sheaf of paper, etc., cetera, for, for a show, though, may I recommend Scriptation? Another oh, podcast okay. for iPad use of exactly that. But um, it's really up to the, the user to research the, uh, the use of inks, what they need, and, and how they function on the individual paper. Because same thing, you can have great inks on bad paper and you're out of business. Or great inks on great paper with bad imagery. So, <laughs> up, to, up to you. All right. So, after these refreshing news, let's go onto our picks of the week we have all brought something and i've i've really i've, I've 
I'm really sure we are not getting any money from Squarespace, but Adrian. No, we're not. No, I'm, paying, I'm, I'm, I'm paying money. So, so this is my pick of the week uh, for all the reasons that we discussed earlier. Really, um, I found it easy to use. I don't, uh, I don't build website. I built one website for our business about eight, nine years ago, and it's just left. It, it was just there because we needed a placeholder. I haven't done anything with it. And I went back to it, and I, I, you know, it was reasonably easy to use. There was help on hand. Gemma, I actually, I didn't answer your question earlier on about service. They have 24-hour people-oriented service. They have chatbots. They have well-documented, you know, service uh, uh, manuals. They have communities of users and stuff like that. So, it, I just find it really easy. Um, so it's my pick of the week because it was really easy, and I don't. If anybody out there is is concerned about how hard it might be to build a website um uh, you could substitute pr pr probably any of the other services for squarespace but that would be my pick of the week just because it's the one i used very good jeremiah you brought us a website no, and you, a photo you, you first me first okay you want to end the show okay i brought <laughs> us I've br I've brought us a little walk down into photography history, actually into into the start of the photography. So um, let me try to get this together. And this is about a video by Vox. I love these. There's a little photography series there, and one is about <clears throat> the first faked photograph. Um, if you um, go back into the history of photography in 1939 pretty much Louis Daguerre invented photography 1839 18, 18, 18. Uh, 18 sorry 1839 uh, but, but also in 1839 Hippolyte Bayard also invented photography that guy was a government employee he gained very little recognition for inventing photography because um, Daguerre's Good friend was the the boss of the Academy of Sciences in Paris, in yeah. France. So, see, in England, um, it wasn't Daguerre at all. It was Fox Talbot. He invented. I know, I so, know. You know who, who invented photography in Germany? Well, I don't know, but uh, the thing is, uh, in in France at least, uh, Bayard um, asked the, the the boss of the Academy of Sciences to present his invention. The boss of the Academy of Sciences told him, "Yeah, you can do this after Mr. Daguerre presented <laughs> his." And as a result, uh, Daguerre's process pretty much took off and gained fame and he received a state pension. And uh, at the same time, Bayard's work was pretty much overshadowed and never really happened. And then Bayard protested by creating a series of selfies. <laughs> of, and not just that, of suicide photos. So he faked his own suicide in a photo um, and on the back of the photo, he wrote, uh, several photos, by the way, on the back of the photo, he wrote, the corpse which you see here is that of Monsieur Bayard, inventor of the process that you have just been see, uh, shown. <laughs> as far as I know, his in indefatigable experimenter, uh, he has been occupied for about three years with his discovery. The government, which has been only too generous to Monsieur Daguerre, uh, said it can do nothing for Monsieur Bayard, and the poor wretch has drowned himself all oh, the vagaries of human life <laughs> so of course he didn't he faked it um and uh, pretty much gave everyone including the french government the, f the middle finger this way and uh, he f he kept he kept doing photography for like 45 years after that so he didn't really die but he <laughs> was he was probably leg legitimately one of the early if not the first photography <coughs> artist who used it for art because he set things up. He created um, pictures, including selfies, even back in 1839. So, cool. so speak, speaking of fake photography, um, I put this up on our uh, shared uh, site as well as in the notes. I have no idea what it will translate here. This photo? Um, yes. Uh, this is uh, the latest in fake photography. I, I made this this week. Um, or should I say I captured it this week? <laughs> you had, you had, uh, uh, I, let me, if, if I can make a guess here, I would say Mid Journey version 5, the that latest Mid absolutely, Journey. Absolutely and you know right. how I can tell? Because she has the right amount of fingers, fingers. on her hand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
That is absolutely the telltale. Yeah. Uh, it's getting much better. But um, I just, I point this out for the absolute astonishment. Um, now, taking it one step further, I made a light flex print uh, uh, using Ilford. Um, what is a light flex print? Uh, light flex, there are not many machines. One exists here um, in it, with a printer I used to use who printed all my Cibachromes. Really, really high end, very, very advanced printer. The uh, LightJet is a large machine. Generally, um, you load the paper in the dark. It exposes your file using lasers. Then the paper is taken out and developed um, in standard photographic um, chemicals and then dried. It's continuous tone. Um, and it's indistinguishable. It's a, it is a silver print. Um, the only difference is the exposure is not from an enlarger with light through a negative. It's, it's lasers um, from lasers. a file. Lasers are amazing. And so that's this photographic machine, paper, yeah? So you're use, so, so using... Using pho standard photographic paper. So, but, but instead of having, for, for listeners that may not be aware, you would normally expose your photographic paper by shining a light through your negative or positive. So, uh, yeah, onto that paper. So what you're saying is it's not happening through that medium. It's happening by use of lasers to expose the yes. photographer based on a digital file. Presumably the lasers are interpreting a digital file. Yeah, and maybe we'll do a show on LightFlex printing because mm. it's it's quite astonishing. But there's only a few that do it archivally on on black and white. Um, and um, I used a semi gloss paper, and uh, it is <laughs> it's like you you it, it's indistinguishable from a photograph. You know the the reality of it um, has no connection to dot you know the dots that are laid down by standard printers so um it just shows you where we're going in the future and gpt4 is out but we're not going to talk about that <laughs> i don't know <laughs> we'll let it talk about itself yes it'll soon do um all right. And I did, oh, yeah. I did bring a little pay, uh, a, a, a kind of... A, a magazine. Yeah, a magazine that I, I really love. It's, I, I find it one of the best photo magazines out there. It's a digital magazine. It's a moderately priced subscription. Um, but it Art is, doc. It is so good and so interesting. And they explore every corner of photography from the most traditional to the most advanced. And... You know, they, they do reach out to photographers and they, they pull in interesting people. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I had an article in it. Um, that's how I discovered it. I mean, they, they kind of hit me on the, the old um, webs and um, they did a beautiful job. But I just love the, just the way they organize it and monthly themes. So it's highly recommended. Very good. So links to all these things will be in the show notes, of course. And uh, yeah, photography. What is a photo? And uh, do we really care about a Samsung phone faking the moon when Jeremiah can just create a, a person with the, with a, a person with the right amount of fingers out of thin air? Well, I am tempted to go and fake a photograph of the moon and put it on my new website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go do that. Make it a project. Make it a project. The fake moon landing by Adrian Stock. How fake moon that? landing. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, do, do the whole thing. Do the whole thing. Cardboard and aluminum foil Didn't and everything. Didn't somebody do that about 50 years or so ago? <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> We'll be back next week with more photography. And uh, until then, everyone, go to uh, thefuturephotography.com. Take care. And bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Music